Kamau, I thought I would start with um, uh, sort of a general introduction to Caribbean literature, a uh, question that, that would lead into that. Uh, many, many of us, most of us, in fact, cons have considered Kamau Brathwaite to be the most important Caribbean writer for a very long time. And because you've been uh, so important for so long, I would like to ask you to comment on how you have seen the transformation of Caribbean literature since the 60s until now. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm not the most, if there's any importance, it is connected with the, the group and the context. Um, I'm always very aware of that, right? Um, what we have suffered from in the Caribbean is a monopolistic attitude in which we have always tried to find one person for everything. In politics, there must be a dictator. In, um, in literature, there must be Derek Walcott. Um, in, you know, there's always a one, one, one. And therefore, what has happened is that there's always been a fight for these scarce resources. And I have suffered tremendously from that because my work has always been, as Norbisi Philip was saying yesterday, in an alternative tradition. And so therefore I was seen as other than the monopoly. And therefore I came in for a lot of flack. And, you know, there was always a business of, of, of zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and that kind of thing. So what, what MJ is doing is signaling that kind of despairing dispute to warn you that we are not really getting into that at all, right? I started writing um, in the 1950s, and my first outlet was with a magazine called BIM, B-I-M, in Barbados, my island. The name BIM itself is a shortened version, a, a, a sort of hmm, nickname for Barbados itself, and it was edited by a very remarkable Barbadian called Frank Cullimer, whose vision as early as post-war, after the Second World War, is that the Caribbean, not only Barbados, but the Caribbean could be a center for literary arts. And he started a journal which made that possible. It became a pool in which people from all over the English and the French-speaking Caribbean um, could send their work at a time when it was impossible to be published, not only in your own country, but even abroad. So the only way that you could have your voice seen was to be published in the magazine BIM. So it was of very great importance, that journal. And as a result of the collection of material that started in BIM from about 1945 and has continued to the present, Kalamad himself died about 10 years ago now, but he's still continuing. People in Britain became interested in Caribbean literature because they could begin to have evidence of it. And the reason why Britain, the publishers in Britain, became interested in Caribbean literature during the 50s is because there was a great migration of Caribbean people into Britain after the, at the end of the Second World War. Between 1945 and 1955, um, Caribbean people were imported into Europe and into Britain to help rebuild their economy. And because of the presence of these the, these, these, these people, um, and the British became interested in a very mild way in other aspects of their culture, including their literary culture, so that as a result you began to have this publishing going on. So that the first phase of Caribbean writing, which I was part of, marginally part of, was the literature of migration. The the stories of your 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 biography or growing up and then your your migration from your homeland to, to, to Britain. It was interesting to listen to Norbesi yesterday saying that when she was growing up she knew that she was going to leave the island. Very interesting. And many, many West Indian writers have confessed to that situation. Naipaul said that 
you know, he knew that he was a genius and that he would design for greatness and that he would he would go to Britain sooner or later. And he went about two months after he had planned to go and that kind of thing. Um, and many others have said that. I was not in that category, I'm afraid. I had always wanted to remain in the Caribbean. I had no vision of, of, of going anywhere else. I felt that I needed to get to understand my own island. And in fact, on the, on, in the months before I had won a scholarship, so I had to go to, to Britain as well, where scholarships were, were finally consummated. But um, I, I, did, I started intensely trying to understand my island at that time. And I had to do this because in my growing up, there was nothing to prepare me for a knowledge of that small island. Complete ignorance of even my own landscape. And as I felt I was going to leave, I started to, to try to photograph it spiritually as best as I could. So that I was part of that first stage of our literature, which was the literature of migration. And there, the attitude was that, you know, there was a certain movement that you fulfill yourself in the Caribbean, and that the Caribbean, having been fulfilled, had to be left behind. It became an empty shell. And the notion was that the Caribbean was a sterile place, and that's why one had to leave. Again, and this was not my position, but this is what... It, that was the ethos of the time. Most writers said that they had to leave the Caribbean because it was a Philistine environment. You find that in George Lamming, in Samuel Selvan, in Andrew Salki, in Jan Carew, in Edgar Mittelholzer, in V.S. Naipaul, that whole group of people who became famous in the 50s. Yes, and, and oh, see, it's all right. Mm -hmm. Fine, because you you we we we're sort of um, touching on you know the question that I was getting ready to ask is about migration, right. exile, and the writer. Ask that one. And I I had a conversation with Earl Lovelace a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. He was in the Virgin Islands, and I, I raised the same issue. And uh, he pointed out, you know, um, very interestingly, that there was a counter uh, movement right. going on, where the, the migration thing is, people are moving back, writers are moving back. And some writers have stayed, and uh, the whole definition and conceptualization of migration and movement and voyage and travel and having a sense of place and alienation. What is happening now is that the world has shrunk, and the the diaspora or the um, Afrospora, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, Nobis uses right. that term, are uh, has developed into a, um, a situation where writers uh, regard themselves of having the right as having the right to um, compose either at, at home, the place where they were born, or abroad, and there's a lot of movement back and forth in some cases. Some decide to stay more, most of the time at home now. Uh, there are others who move back and forth. So the, the, the whole dimensionality and definition and conceptualization of movement seems to at least either changing or being perceived differently at this point in time. Do you have any comments uh, on, 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 on um, some of those dynamics? You know, what would sort of lead a loveless to, um, in effect, reject the need uh, to migrate or to sort of um, consider uh, oneself as an exile right, right, yeah. and to sort of um, more or less uh, recognize and reconcile the role of the writer within his community as part of it, um, not leading necessarily but moving alongside and with and collaborating right. with the society and in some ways being led by the community and in other ways sort of, um, sort of um, reciprocating that. So there's a right. different kind of you know, a relationship. No, yeah, I've yes. talked about that because in fact it still connects with what you were saying. The 50s is the period of migration and they go to Britain, right? And the idea is that the Caribbean is Philistine and that you fulfill yourself in Britain. What happens in Britain, however, is that there is disappointment. You do not get fulfilled. You get published, but you don't get recognized. <laughs> You're never considered a writer. And George Lamming in The Pleasures of Exile made that very clear and angered the English establishment to such a degree, in fact, that they stopped publishing our work to a significant degree, as bad as that. Now, at the same time, by 19... 
early 1960s, the English Caribbean, English speaking Caribbean was becoming independent, politically independent, and therefore you get another ideology coming up. Why are we going to be independent? That means that we must have a culture, we must have a nationhood, we must have some status. And therefore you began to get a, a number of writers having a choice between migrating to this disillusioned metropole or remaining in the Caribbean and becoming national writers. People like Earl Lovelace are examples of that and most of the women writers who have come up since. Also, several of the writers who lived abroad also decided to come back to help build the nation. And so that the literature of the 60s is a literature which becomes nativist in its ideology and its orientation. Can I ask mm -hmm. one little parenthesis? What effect do you think that the Cuban Revolution had on this return to the Not Caribbean? enough. Not surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly, this is another thing we have to come up. The compartmentalization of the Caribbean is awesome. Even although Fidel was 90 miles away from Jamaica, it was as if it didn't happen. I mean, there were rumors of this thing, but there was no sense that this had made a difference. It, had, it made no difference in the literature. In fact, in the literature of the 60s and 70s, there's hardly a reference to Cuba at all, far less the Cuban Revolution. So that it is not until the late 70s when there is a diplomatic rapprochement between Cuba Jamaica, Trinidad, and some of the other Caribbean islands. And the Cubans, because of that rapprochement, are able to visit the Caribbean and create ex cultural exchanges that you begin to have some understanding of the, the nature of the Cuban revolution. And may I ask, following up on mm. this, how does this process of metropolitan sanctioning of what happens in the Caribbean uh, then affect you know, the attitudes of um, you know, one Caribbean country to another, uh, not only in the area of, say, the Cuban situation, of all the areas, but yeah. um, political, mm, and literature, yeah. and music, calypso, reggae. Could you mm. comment on that? It keeps them compartmentalized. The yeah. whole idea is that, you, you, I mean, the best example I have apart from the business of Cuba is um, the island of St. Lucia, which is part of the culture of the French-speaking culture of the Eastern Caribbean. Um, let imagine that you were living in St. Lucia at the time of the Amerindians. If I were living at the time before Columbus and I was living in St. Lucia, I could look across the water and I would see Martinique and my relatives would be living in Martinique. And if I wanted to visit my relatives, I would send a signal to them, smoke, glass, mirrors, something like that, and I would say, I'm coming over and I will reach you by tomorrow. And I would then get into my canoe and we would paddle across the, the, the 60 miles of water, the 50 miles of water, and I would reach my uncle in Martinique the next morning. Now, thanks to the, the interruption of this connection by metropolitan powers, Martinique is French and St. Lucia is English. If I want to get to St. Lucia, to Martinique from St. Lucia today, I would either have to swim or I would have to get a liner, an English liner, that would take me from St. Lucia all the way back up to London. Then I would get a channel, or I would go now under the tunnel. Um, I would then have to go to France, get a French liner that would take me right back down to <laughs> it's as bad as that. It would take two weeks where it would take a day. And that is what has happened. And it's happened in every respect, not only in trade and in communications, but in the sense of comradeship, in the sense of literature. I, as I said, knew nothing about the Cuban Revolution. It was only recently that I became aware of the work of M.A. Césaire, perhaps the greatest poet the Caribbean has produced. You heard rumors of Césaire tour of Pai Natal, but there was never any way that we could become, come into contact with the work of this great man. And that has been our problem ever since. Even today, 1990s, the compartmentalization continues. There's the University of the West Indies, which has hardly any connection with the University of Havana, 
because of political divisions, and hardly any with the university departments that are in Martinique and Guadeloupe. And they have had writers' conferences in the Caribbean, which have remained unilingual. You have English-speaking conferences or French-speaking conferences, but hardly anything which cuts across, which not cuts across, which attempts to bring them to their natural state of a community. Yes, so it has affected yes. us tremendously. That's right, and, and, and the co corollary to this, of course, is the whole process of approving as well, which tends to um, you know, proceed from the metropole. So Reagan and Calypso tend to get accepted in the Caribbean, generally speaking, um, as a result, partly as a result, mainly as a result sometimes, of approval in the metropole. And then that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. And literature, uh, as obviously, you know. But there's one development, as you speak, which is cutting that, you know, the strange, this how things happen, the grassroots, have started to infiltrate this metropole, and it's coming through the music. Suddenly, the musicians and the dub poets, which is the latest stage of Caribbean literature, have started to ignore all sorts of national and international boundaries. And now there are reggae concerts that take place with equal fluency in Martinique and in Barbados. Um, there are dub poets who travel from Bremen in Germany to Barbados in, 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 in the Caribbean, you know, non-stop flight. And then from Barbados, they go to Guadeloupe and as the old troubadours used to do it. So at that level of the grassroots, and thanks to the electronic age, um, we are beginning at last to have some kind of coming together of a territory that has always been one. I mean, the whole tragedy of the Caribbean is that geographically, these islands are within sight of each other, and still they're separated because of political incursions from Europe in the 15th century. Yes, the, the islands are sort of within the distance of the skip of a stone. Yes. Uh, and, and, and the whole, the whole um, Afro, the existence of uh, and development of the, the Afrosporic um, reality, you have West Indian communities in Toronto, um, you know, in, in parts of Europe, you know, England, and parts of Germany, all over the place. So there's that international kind of community mm -hmm. of Caribbean people. And uh, I think that probably contributes to the, the, the relative um, you know, role of um, what is happening now with reggae and so on, with the, the artists and now sort of um, recognizing that and making use of that. Yes, there's, there's yes. a lot of that happening. But in the Caribbean itself, there is still not enough awareness of the connections. And coming back to Cuba, which is such an important item there. Casa de las Americas. Yes, you know. But the point is that, you know, Again, the grassroots people of the Caribbean were always aware of what Cuba meant, the Cuban Revolution. But um, the establishment, the, 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 the press, the politicians, the, the commercial elements have always successfully ignored it. But there's even a greater, more, more significant forgetting in the Caribbean, which I think is even more tragic for us. Tragic in the sense that, you see, we, are, we have bought the notion that we are unsuccessful people. We have bought the notion of this sterility, of this, this, this Philistinism. We have bought it. We really believe it. We operate from that notion that as colon colonies, we have no future. Yes, Naipaul said it in, in his book, Middle Passage, and although we objected to his saying it, people behave in that way. But the thing that we have forgotten most awesomely, most, you know, in the most hurtful way in the Caribbean is not only the revolution in Cuba, but the revolution that took place in Haiti, right? In 1789, 1790, the slaves of Saint-Domingue successfully revolted against Napoleon Bonaparte, against the French Empire. And under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, conducted the first and only ever successful slave rebellion the world has ever known. That is a, an event of tremendous importance. I mean, that's a victory for the underclass, which is, you know, stupendous. And still no one in the Caribbean, you know, has any knowledge of it, has not 
No one in the Caribbean has internalized it. If you look around for literature that reflects, apart from the Haitians themselves, Caribbean literature in, in Spanish or in English that reflects the importance of the, of the Haitian Revolution, you'll find very little. People don't even understand very much about Toussaint Louverture. And he, again, he has been demonized and distorted and therefore it does not allow us that trigger into the future which we would normally have had or which we should have had. You know, here's a victory which we should understand and use. We should fly that flag. So it's not only, and they're all within, as you say, skipping distance of the Caribbean. There is a revolution in Haiti which we have ignored from the English-speaking point of view. And there's a revolution now in Cuba that we have ignored. And therefore, we go on saying that we are Philistine people of no possibility. And it's, it's important, as you say, to recognize, looking at um, these events in their historical and social context, that when the Haitian Revolution took place, you may very well imagine that even though there were many people of Afri African descent and others who supported that idea, there were many others who did not support it in much the same way as there are many people from the Caribbean who did not support the Cuban Revolution. We need to understand that when you're living in that time frame, your reaction to what is happening to the liberating um, attempts of people to liberate themselves you know, uh, from imperialism, uh, you may not support it because you're being controlled by the media and by your educational system. And, and, and I think that's a very powerful and important point to understand. So many of our reactions to what happens in Cuba and the ambiguities and ambivalence, we should try to compare that to the reactions of maybe many um, Afro-Americans at the time in living in the South, okay, their reactions to the Haitian Revolution. We should not assume blanket fashion that they all approved of it. Okay? And uh, we also need to note the connection between uh, the Haitian Revolution and Louisiana, for instance, and the correspondence and the military correspondence and communication that took place between the two. And that that's something that you may wish to comment on because that's a very powerful trope that I think that needs to be highlighted more fully. No, I wouldn't comment. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the sort of nervousness it caused, you know, um, it caused, you know, the US government yeah. and so on. And it's a very important point. What hope do you see now for Caribbean unity? Both, not only in, in political and economic terms, but in literature. But it would be connected. Unless, unless it came politically, it would hardly come any other way. I, I don't see any, any immediate possibility for anything very real, you know. Um, the Caribbean still remains divided in economic interests. The, the metropoles of Britain have their own program, and the French have a different program. Although there's a European Union now, there's no sign that that European Union is being reflected in a Caribbean Union. So I think it's convenient for the metropolitan powers to leave us divided because we remain cheap labor, which is the, the basic idea. You know, we remain dependent colonies, a way of feeding the fuel for the missile. But I would like us to talk a lot more now about the literature itself and about my role in that, you know, because I think that is so important. Because I want to explain to you that I sit before you as a poet, you see. It is, it is, it is, it is something that you have to understand. Um, you know, I, I've always find myself apologizing for that. <laughs> because the, the expectation is that you are you know, if you put poet on your passport, you're going to have problems with the immigration authorities. That is a, a, a landless, laborless occupation. It, it is a person of no fixed address. And that is unfortunate because unless we can restore poetry to somewhere in the center of our universes, um, we are going to lose a lot of stars, a lot of constellation, a lot of light. You know, now you see, I come here, and and you sit here as academics, as a university community. 
and I am a professor at a university. And therefore, the instinct is that you must speak in terms of the academy. But always, I have never been in the academy. I mean, I happen to have a job in the academy, and I'm very glad I had, because I don't get royalties from my poetry. I would be a real starving poet if that were the case. But I have never lost the, the recognition that the poetry is where the power is. And let me give you one example of this, right? When I returned to the Caribbean from Africa, I was aware, standing, I was meant to live in St. Lucia, and on the promontory there at St. Lucia, on the morn, I, I saw this mist coming from the Atlantic towards the island, obscuring the same Martinique I spoke about. And as this, this mist or this cloud approached, I could feel on my skin a dryness, a desiccation, which I was, had been aware of in Africa. And in Africa, they call that the Harmattan. I spoke about that yesterday. This dry wind that comes out of the Sahara. And it suddenly occurred to me, and as a metaphor, that this wind that, was, that I saw in the Atlantic was the same Harmattan from Africa, which was in fact reaching the Caribbean. Now that's a very important discovery because it right away showed me or internalized for me the fact that there was a geological connection between Africa and the Caribbean. And because of that, I was able as a historian, you see, it is the metaphor prece preceding the, the, the research. Having recognized that the Harmattan came from Africa and that it was possible for the winds of the Sahara to traverse the Atlantic. See, meteorologists had told me that there was no way that desert sand could, could move from the Sahara across 5,000 miles across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. They told me it was impossible. I stood on that promontory with the chief meteorological officer of the Caribbean, and he told me I was talking foolishness, <laughs> right? It was not until that dust from the Sahara one day moved north to Paris and London that they went into a panic and said, hey, what's happening? We're being invaded by Africa. <laughs> <laughs> right? Big, I remember the panic. They sent balloons up in the air and they did all sorts of tests. It was possible for dust from the Sahara to travel. In this case, it, it, it had a, a, a sort of strange, unfortunate twist to it, and it went north. But this dust has always traveled across the Atlantic. Now, I noticed also that this dust, that, that this feeling I had on my skin, which is the same feeling you got from the dust in Africa, started occurring around October. Okay. And October, November, December, that's the very time when the flowers begin to bloom, when it is almost beautiful time of year, dry season. I went back to the research books, the history documents, to discover when do slaves come into the Caribbean? October, November, December. When the wind is blowing, the sailing ships will use that corridor of wind. And also it is the dry season, and therefore the slaves are likely to be in better health. You don't want to bring them in during the wet season. So right away, this perception of a geological connection done through poetic perception, right? I was able then to confirm those things in terms of historical research. In other words, things, questions which were not possible of the archives. It was not possible to ask the archives certain questions until a vision was available. And right away I was able to make the connection between the slave trade and Africa, between the arrival of slaves in the Caribbean and Africa. I was able to make a connection between Carnival, the, the, the very, because the documents also said that at Christmas time, the slaves did more drumming than usual and did a lot of canoe mass dancing, December. And the, the slave owners thought that this was because 
they were having some memory of a European festival, when in fact they were having a memory of an African festival, and they were using this as a memory and as an antidote against their oppression, right? Things like that became possible. And then later on, because of this sense again of geological connection, I was asked to do some research on a strange woman that had, that had discovered in Jamaican history called Nanny of the Maroons. This was a, a leader, a, a warrior, a warrior queen who, had, who, who was mythologically present in Jamaican history. And the Jamaican government wanted to make her into a national hero or heroine. But there was a lot of problems because Nanny was supposed to be a witch and you couldn't have a hero heroine as a witch. And there were also other features about her which were quite despicable in a way or laughable or whatever you call it. The biggest and one that is still repeated is that <clears throat> in defiance of the British, she used to turn her back to the British, turn her back to the bullets, catch the bullets in her backside and fart them back out at the enemy. <laughs> this is a, this what a is great a, national yes. hero. <laughs> I couldn't make it. Now, because of my concept of, because of my poesis, right, and because of this connection, I, my instinct was that Nanny had to have an antecedent in Africa, that she could not have been a witch, she could not have been this kind of woman. And right away, and since I lived in Africa as well, I started to remember that every time there was a meeting of the village elders, there was always a woman who sat there with her back turned to the audience, <laughs> not in the position that Nanny was supposed to, but that she was the person who they always consulted. And I remember that she was regarded as the keeper of the tribe. And the historical research that started made me recognize that on a national West African level, there was Nzinga Nzinga, there was Ya Santiwa. There were always women who, when the males failed in battle or failed politically, this keeper of the tribe had the authority to take over power and to, to carry the group into battle and into a reconstruction of their status. And that, that is what was happening in Jamaica. This Nanny of the Maroons was not only a warrior woman, but she was actually the woman who organized the, the political arrangements for the Maroons of Jamaica. So it was possible to, to write a history of this witch woman based upon the notion that there is a continuity between the culture of Africa and the culture of the African Caribbean. And that was only done because of, of the poem. The poem preceded the history. And that is why I made that statement that you have to forgive me if I constantly think in terms of the metaphor, because the world is balanced between those two forces. And as a poet, one conceives of literature essentially as spirit rather than as politics. Yes, sir, and that uh, brings me to um, uh, this point about the, the, uh, the whole um, role of the poet mm -hmm. as, as someone who helps articulate through language, through image, you know, to, through metaphor, you know, um, the, the multivocal concerns of the community and to crystallize those notions that, that you know, um, will in future be then become um, the bread and butter, you of know, the of the people. Yeah, right. And I'm interested in knowing, you know, what role does the nexus between jazz, you see, mm -hmm. and uh, written poetry play right, in, form, in, in, right, in, form, yeah. in, in that process. Mm -hmm. Well, there also, the thing, what we are getting at here is the problem that faces, that face me. I have to use it that way. But I can now see it faced other people who try to solve it in another way. Here we are in the Caribbean in 1950s, attempting to write 
Caribbean. That's the first thing, that's the first challenge. Before that, we would write, I wandered lonely as a cloud. <laughs> because that's what we knew. Cartridge, that's what we had. But if you, for some sudden reason, say that, like in my case, it was, you know, how did the Caribbean begin? What's the genesis? What's the book of Genesis here? And it's a song, as long as you do that, you, have, you suddenly are challenged by the need to find a form and a language which is native, which is not I wandered lonely as a cloud. You, you realize that. But you have no, you know, no model. That's the frightening thing. You're faced with a horrible silence, dumbness. Because the native population, the, the models that should have preceded you, had been dis already destroyed by Columbus and company. The Amerindian population of the Caribbean is practically extinct, so that there is no native model. <coughs> and the imported model is English or French, again, what you're trying to avoid. So that you have to begin by trying to find another model, and what you would consider a model that is more native than Wordsworth. And in my case, it was jazz. Now, it, it could have been anything, really, I realize now. But I had started with jazz because at school I, start, I became interested not just in jazz, but it was the time of Charles Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. It was the revolution, that interruption of the tradition there. And the bebop, it was, it was clearly a revolutionary thing. And it, it made us quite notorious at school because people were listening to other forms of if it was jazz at all, they're interested in other forms of it. So that right away I saw that there was a model for, for revolt against the canon, right there, right there and then. And, but at the same time, I realized that jazz had a tone quality, a speech quality to it, which was similar to the way that our people spoke, that if you listen to jazz, the riffs, and the syncopation and the flattened fifths and the blue notes and so on, that you could begin to, it was a pattern similar to our speech patterns. And therefore I started trying to write poems that were in imitation of jazz contour. And the more I did this, the more I discovered that I was reaching closer to the experience of Caribbean, that it gave me a way of writing about my beach my trees, my concept of shadows on the horizon, islands looming like whales on the horizon, things like that, which I could not get from Wordsworth or Shakespeare or Tennyson or any of the people we did in school. And this must be where um, Alejo Carpentier started using the term magic realism because yeah. from the European perspective he saw what you were doing right. rather than seeing it as realism, right. he saw it as magic. Right, they, they saw it as magic because it didn't fit into, into the European concept. You see of it reality. through another spectrum, yes, right. That, that is, we never called it magic of realism, course, by the reality. way. It's yeah, reality. Not only that, but again, the connection, the disconnection between ourselves and, and 100 years of solitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, Colombia. Garcia never heard of him. I mean, this is impossible to conceive of. But you know, but we were also using that magical rhythm as a, it has. It's a natural response to the to the environment and to reality by people who have been consumed, mm -hmm. people who have been submerged. And now it's an MLA section. Yes, now of course it's a big thing, right? It's become a big part with, of the with industry. With the North, the North American academics redefining ah. Caribbean reality. Exactly. Of course. Well, academics always redefine everything. Of course. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's part our of job. It. I mean, you're trained that way to redefine. Either define, which is the first stage, or the more the more interesting stage is the redefine, because you have more freedom. Right. That's why they call it creative writing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing with Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland and the Looking Glass and so on. So on. Finding who's, who's going to label it and so on. It's going to be a boss. <laughs> We have some audience questions, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, you've articulated your, your poetics, and I think one of the, the interesting things, if you look at the body of poetry you've produced over the last 30 years, there's 
there's obviously a real strong continuity in your message and, and embracing the islands and, and bringing Africa into the Caribbean islands. But I'm, I'm interested in some of the changes, too. If you look at a book like your first book, Rites of Passages, and then X Self, and then say something like Trenchtown Rock right. that's recent, um, there's, there's some incredible developments and right. changes in there. And I, I would like to hear you talk about some of those moves that have, that have happened mm. in your poetry. Yeah, well, this is a challenging question. This is a... Um, changes take place in, in anything in one's work according to what happens around you, right? When I started, I was concerned with trying to, to write a syncopated narrative, a broken a narrative of broken chain, broken islands, broken slavery, and therefore the lines of the poetry and the technical sense, the poetics, were very thin lines, like Miles Davis' trumpet. Right? Mm. That was the idea. But uh, as I became more confident, I think this is what happens, as I came back into the Caribbean, and I discovered not only that jazz was a trigger, but then increasingly the folk music of the Caribbean took over from jazz, because I recognized that jazz still was not native to us. It was the Kaiso, and then the, the, the Kumina, and the various things I spoke about yesterday. I found that the thing began to, the, the poetics began to go this way. Um, and it was a different song, it was deeper, it was, it was a lower, it was a ground, underground song, 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 which have all of those things. And I became very interested, oh there, there's so many things. I hope this is not, you know, you're okay, you all have to agree, they jump from one. You see, always I have had the idea that Shakespeare is a Caribbean writer. <laughs> <laughs> our premier writer and the tempest is the great book on the plantation and that you know these people as you sisters of caliban right and now the thing that is fascinating me as i move into the caribbean is not so much any more prosper and caliban and this notion of revolution or revolt and fighting but that submerged mother called sycorax the person who bears the nation language the one that Caliban ought to be listening to, but does not, and hence he fails, right? And therefore, as I become more interested in the underground, the under drone, the lines begin to, to go like that, okay? And you'll see that this line gets longer through mass and into islands. But now when I come to ex-self, ex-self, it really means an intersection. I was, uh, you know, this is an interesting poem because I wrote this poem about four years before I felt I could publish it. I really did genuinely feel that people would not understand the poem. And when I said people, I was living in the Caribbean, and I meant the people that I was concerned with. I don't know, no doubt up here you all would have had no problem with it, right? But I, I and the, the idea of this poem was that there are two, the notion of equilibrium, had reached me, the notion of equilibrium, that there are two forces anywhere in a cosmos, and that when one force rises, it rises or expands, imperialism, in metropoles, Europe, Mont Blanc, it rises at the expense of the other, and that the other is diminished, and that Africa, the Caribbean, the black world was being diminished by the rise of the, let's call it the atom bomb. It was at a time when that was happening. All the African movements were failing. Our own independence was failing. We had not achieved what we had thought we would achieve. So that Excelf is a poem of the crossroads where I begin to recognize that all of the dreams I had had, the metaphors I had had faith in might be inadequate. That I, you're not getting anywhere with this. And therefore Excelf begins to going for a lot of new dislocation and the equilibrium which I would say is, is an ideal for, the, for any, any world, any 
any world, any true world, any peaceful world, any beautiful world was was going in favor of one group only. This is a time when we had these horrible television pictures of children starving in Sahil and in, in Sudan, you know, this is the kind of thing. And that's what Excelf is about. And then you come to that movement within Excelf where from the underground this young man is writing the letter to his mother Sycorax, in fact, telling him that he is now about to start attempting a new technology, the computer. And the computer is being seen even then as a way of restoring some of that balance in the disequilibrium. So it's the Excel really is a transitional point between the narrative of dislocation into the narrative of true location. And then Trenchtown Rock, there's yeah. an explosion on but, the page. Well, the not visual. only, yes, the, but that's because the computer is now very much possible. But Trenchtown Rock is part of another trilogy, which is even more, oh dear, tragic? I don't know if that's the word, yeah. You see, what happens in my own biography, the, the, the biography of the metaphor, is that I after the Excel is written and I am very confident about Sycorax and the possibilities of unsubmergence I write a poem called Flutes which you have in your anthology now Flutes is a poem which symbolizes for me the possibility of maroon efflorescence now, I, I spoke about Maroon yesterday as well. I did a lot of those. I mean, yeah, I must apologize, by the way. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to say something, and I felt that since you are so interested in the Caribbean, I ought to give you a, a cosmology of the whole thing so that conversation would be easier on the Caribbean, not necessarily for this session, but ongoing, because you don't. I'm sure you're not here just to as tourists into the Caribbean for, for three days. I mean, this is a project that you are as concerned with.